Okay, our next uh, speaker is uh, Bruce Randall. Uh, he's gonna be talking on an active E-field antenna for 15 to 40 megahertz radio astronomy. Uh, born 1949, he is getting to be an old timer. Uh, Bruce got his first ham radio license. Now, he wrote this, by the way, so don't don't blame me. Um, anyway, Bruce got his first ham radio license in 1966. He presently has an extra class license. In the call of N uh, November Tango for Romeo Tango, the uh, Romeo Tango and the call sign is for radio telescope. Uh, Bruce has uh, worked as an electronic engineer since 1978 with involvement in analog circuit design, power supplies, bit of uh, digital signal processing work, and some antenna design. His hobbies include astronomy, ham radio, and radio astronomy. Bruce also enjoys canoeing, hiking, as time permits. Uh, Bruce has been a SARA member for over 25 years. He's now a life member. His experiments with radio astronomy. Uh, Stand by. Started in 1990, in the days of the chart recorder and the output device. He's interested in interferometers and possible extended baselines in the future. Uh, Bruce has been uh, on the SARA board in the past and presently SARA secretary. Okay, uh, Bruce, go ahead. Okay, it looks like we're going here. Okay, so I should be able to advance slides with, uh, uh, okay, and yeah, the little laser pointer thing works. Okay. So uh, talking about uh, active antennas here, and of course there are some on a very large scale like the uh, uh, LWA and MWA, which are you know, 20 to 80 and 70 to 300 megahertz. So that's definitely the uh, big scale of that. Or I'm talking about active antennas on a small scale. I guess I can call it the uh, back garden array and 15 to 40 megahertz. And I've been doing quite a bit of experimenting with this as we'll uh, see here. First, there's a few possible types of active antennas there. And this actually doesn't cover everything. This slide came from a German website from uh, Gunther Fred Mandel. Uh, who, uh, by the way, his website is listed in my references because he has a whole lot of good material. It's written in German, so sometimes it's a little hard to sort out, but it's very good material on active antennas. So if you're interested in that, uh, his website is worthwhile. But, you know, active antennas, okay, we can kind of split them into two groups uh, right off the bat, magnetic or electrostatic field uh, type of devices. And then with each of those, you have either selective or broadband antenna. A selective antenna can give you a little more uh, signal output for a given amount of, uh, you know, antenna out there. Uh, you know, I'll, you'll see there's some disadvantages on that later, but either magnetic or the electric can go be split up like that. Okay, what I went for was a E-field horizontal dipole uh, on that. And horizontal because of radio astronomy needs, which we'll see in the next slide. And E-field, that was chosen just because of uh, some construction, you know, issues on that and more familiarity to me because I'd used E-field probes in uh, test labs and things before in the past. So, you know, familiarity always helps a little. Okay, uh, you need a broadband antenna. And the reason for that is that if you're putting two antennas in together in an array or uh, 500 antennas in an array like the uh, you know, big ones, uh, the phase response of the antenna has to be predictable. And if it's got a narrow band, uh, any minor variations in resonant frequency would um, you know, cause phase discontinuities, which is very bad when you're trying to sum things together, you need predictable phase. Uh, okay, dipole because uh, you know, mo monopole is inherently vertically polarized. We'll see that in a, a minute here. What I do here? I went back somehow. There's where I want to be. Okay, so uh, here's a, you know, some of the reason for a, a horizontal there. If you have a dipole horizontally polarized above uh, either perfect ground or real ground, which I don't know if the real ground easy neck is in uh, you know typical soil in Kansas, kind of the geometric center of the uh, continental U.S. or you know what they use for real ground. But anyway, it's. Uh, now, I think typical soil, it's not salt marsh and not desert, it's somewhere in between. And you notice the horizontal polarized doesn't change pattern much from that, for one thing. 
uh, vertical antenna has a couple of things against you for radio astronomy. First, the HF range, you have a lot of sky wave stuff possibly coming in. So you definitely don't want your maximum response at the horizon. Uh, you want your max response overhead and a null at the horizon, which the horizontal has. And even above real ground, the vertical still has a lot of response at the horizon and a hole overhead, which would uh, yeah, not be good for that. So I definitely want a horizontal polarization. Hey, let's think about an EFA, uh, yeah, yeah, e field uh, antenna, yeah, how it would uh, work. You got an electromagnetic wave traveling through space, uh, vertically polarized, and it snakes its way through space there. Uh, it's trying to head towards uh, what I like to think of as kind of a mirage of a 377 ohm resistor because uh, the wave always looks out ahead of it and thinks it sees 377 ohms, but yet it travels some distance and it's still sees 377 ohms in front of it as a load. But the E field, we're gonna just look at the voltage across. It's just like putting a voltmeter across the uh, you know, a line voltage where a space heater is plugged in. The voltmeter has almost no effect on it. And same thing is true of an E field antenna that it's uh, you know, designed to have an absolute minimum effect and uh, doesn't generate any significant shadow behind the antenna as a consequence. Whereas a regular dipole, it tries to uh, slurp some power out of the wave as it comes by and will create quite a shadow. So anyway, that is a difference in the uh, you know, E-field probe. And uh, as we go to very short antennas and broad bandwidth, that's about the only way you can go. Yeah, I want to look at the sky temperature at 30 megahertz. There seems to be a little discrepancy in this and some other work that we've seen on how hot the sky is. But uh, still, it's uh, pretty hot uh, at that uh, frequency, uh, frequency. And you can see the whole galactic thing. You can see if you get near the galactic plane, you're talking about uh, you know, 700 kilo Kelvin, uh, kilo Kelvins there. Maybe Keller was right. I don't know. They are uh, definitely a strong signal. Uh, and even when you get towards the galactic poles down at the uh, bottom and top of the page, you still get down, uh, you know, 50 uh, Kelvin, uh, 50 kilokelvin area. So it's a quite strong signal you're working with. So trying to look at what, what's the antenna gain that we're gonna need for this. Uh, and uh, first we gotta say, this is gain and not directivity. They're very different things. I mean, a normal antenna with a very high efficiency, uh, gain and directivity are really the same things. It's, it's you know, what the pattern is and where it uh, receives power from are the uh, same and it receives all of it. So gain and directivity will match. On this, it'll definitely mismatch because we need the directivity of a dipole. And as we put several of these together, uh, we'd need, um, you know, a better, we'd get better directivity. Uh, okay, went to uh, Dave Tipinski's uh, you know, paper. It's a very good reference. I found later it's at his website, which I uh, don't have listed as a reference because I found it in Radio Astronomy, uh, you know, our journal first. But anyway, he uh, has an extensive paper on that subject, very good reading, and his website has even more on the subject. But anyway, sky noise at 20 megahertz, where you might be listening to Jupiter, you're talking about uh, 50 uh, uh, kilokelvin uh, worth of uh, you know, temperature, so it's very hot. So if you took a, a receiver with a 290K noise temperature, which is reasonably easy to attain, uh, you know, no special super low noise stuff for that, and you could have minus 20 dBi antenna gain and still have the signal a little bit out of the noise. So you know, our active antenna doesn't need a real high efficiency for uh, you know, the HF range because of the extreme of background noise. They go through a, a little math model that I you know, put together there, a little cartoon sort of thing. Uh, and I like to sometimes put values on things, even though you could have left the distance as part of an equation that's sorted out in the end kind of thing or uh, you know, cancels out. But uh, you know, I like to have a physical different distance and a physical power level. So I got a one watt uh, transmitter feeding a half wave dipole. And no matter which frequency I work at, these half-wave dipoles are going to be half-wave at that uh, at that frequency, and it'll have a 73 ohm load or a matched load on the dipole. And in free space, uh, 73 ohms will match the dipole very close. Uh, the other antenna there, a kilometer the other side of it, 
is going to be a short dipole. In this case, I'm using 1.2 meters. We'll see later how I showed up with that uh, uh, number. But yeah, so on this, we're going to calculate received voltage. Here, we're going to calculate received power. Okay, so uh, I was getting that with the dipole size requirement where I said already I went for a 1.2 meter. I actually experimented with a lot of different sizes and was hoping that uh, you yeah, know more like a half meter dipole would be useful for this thing. Uh, you yeah, know, no way that's going to get it. That uh, you know 1.2 meters was kind of the minimum to get a workable system. Anyway, get uh, Fritz equation, which uh, you yeah, know Fritz strange name spelling. He was uh, one of the Bell Labs people that. Uh, you know, did some work on uh, commu radio communications and established, well, you know, you're, you want to know your received power, you put it in this formula and turn the crank and out comes the received power. Uh, then there's an E-field calculation. What's the E-field that comes out of a, uh, you know, uh, an antenna source? And there you get 30 times the power of the transmitter times the gain or essentially the ERP over the uh, distance where, you know, everything's in meters there. Uh, 30, I looked a little strange when I looked that formula up and I you know, looked at it before. Some other, I thought, well, it's 30. Why isn't it 42 or some other number? Uh, well, if you, and I actually went and tried to derive that and I managed to get it from uh, things in, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, what is it, physics of antenna book from the ARRL. But anyway, looked at that and a few other things and turned the crank on a bunch of uh, math calculations. You can start with that. The impedance of space is, 377 ohms or 120 pi. And you got a four pi right here. So when 120 pi is divided by four pi, you get the 30. So there is a reason where the 30 showed up there. It was, like I said, I was a little suspicious to start with. Uh, okay, I used easy neck analysis for all of the uh, uh, cross check against the other stuff done. Uh, a lot of, there are a lot of folks in the group that don't trust XLS speech sheets because uh, it's too easy to take a spreadsheet and have a hidden formula that's wrong and not realize it. So uh, I used uh, you know, easy neck analysis of a few examples and checked against it to make sure I got it. Now, if I was gonna go for that today, I would go to four neck two antenna analysis, which is free and has no memory limitations. And uh, you know, it's a, a nice tool, it still uses the same NEC core to do calculations and gets the same results. But anyway, I'm using easy neck because I bought it and familiar with it. Okay, for the calculations, I took, of course, a free space thing. You know, you know, trying to put any environment on an antenna makes things very complicated to analyze. So I just use free space, even though I know free space isn't the actual case. It'll be good for comparison purposes. And again, the 1.2 meter dipole, because if I put a shorter dipole, things didn't add up. Uh, 18 millimeter diameter, that's uh, uh, electrician's conduit from the local Lowe's store. Uh, you know, easy to get material. And frequencies, I uh, ran the calculations at 20, 25, 30, and 35 megahertz. And uh, again, I put a one watt transmitter, one kilometer distance. And I went ahead and assigned a receiver bandwidth to this also, 10 kilohertz, just so that noise could be well defined and take a 290K noise power, uh, uh, you know, of a receiver and, uh, you know, that's 134 dB, uh, minus 134 dBm per hertz, uh, or excuse me, 100 minus, 130, minus 134 dBm, not per hertz, because the per hertz was taken out with that. Uh, okay, if you take a, a look at a uh, the E-field amplifiers, what you can get with things, I mean, a, a good FET will get one antivolt per root hertz, or actually a little better than that is available. Uh, and the root hertz, I mean, you know, you got to think about that a minute that because uh, normally I'm interested in power. Well, if I square voltage and put it over a resistor, I'll get power. If I square root hertz, I'll have hertz. I'll have power per unit hertz. So uh, yeah, the units add up on that. But anyway, with the 10 kilohertz bandwidth and the square root of 10,000 being 100, that gives me uh, uh, basically 100 times the one nanovolt or 100 nanovolts, uh, you know, Receiver noise is about what could be expected. And then I calculate the signal to noise on this whole works. OK, 
Yeah, and then I went to, uh, you know, you know, this all came out of an XLS sheet, which, like I said, there's a group of people that don't trust them. And I, I don't trust them 100% either because I rechecked a bunch of stuff there. Okay, the uh, field strength, when I started it, the uh, crank on the formula for, uh, you know, the one meter distance and the one watt and, uh, yeah, dipole, we turn up with uh, 7,000 microvolts per meter of, uh, you know, uh, electric field strength. And then we get the dipole receive uh, output. Uh, of course, it's going to go down with frequency because uh, the antenna is effectively a smaller aperture at uh, yeah, frequency for the same, higher frequency for the same distance. Okay, and again, 130, minus 134 dBm noise. And then, okay, so the dipole in that case will have these signal to noise ratios there, you know, quite large signal to noise. You probably never get that because of, you know, various contamination in the process, but calculated value. Okay, the EFAIL receive preamp input, uh, we're going to get 2736 microvolts. And I'll uh, talk about how we came up with that uh, you know, later because you might notice it's quite a bit less than the field strength, which that's per meter. And I got a 1.2 meter antenna, so you'd think I would uh, you know, turn up a little higher of a number than that. Preamp input, uh, that came from a, uh, a one paper in my references, uh, got that. And I got the same number using a, a data couple data sheets on FETs and got almost the same number, so just under a tenth microvolt. So then uh, E-field strength uh, over the noise based on that, I've got uh, yeah, just a little short of 90 dB in that 10 kilohertz bandwidth. So that says the penalty I paid for the E-field antenna was 20 dB, 18, 16, 15, which all works out to be just about the minimum I can really live with on that. Yeah, okay. ah, rats. Back up. There, hit the control button so my laser works. There we go. So anyway, I pulled this slide out of a, uh, a presentation by a Professor Dave Stalin, David Stalin at uh, MIT as part of a lecture. And uh, yeah, there's way, it's way too busy of a slide, but I liked his drawing of how the fields go out around a uh, an open circuited dipole. And if you take either half of the dipole, it's just a chunk of metal, so the fields will divert around it. And the field will work out to be the position of the center of this metal rod, and same with this one. So that says that uh, I've got one half for my thing. So in other words, a, a one meter antenna would only be a half meter effective uh, length because of uh, you know, the way the fields go around it there. Another issue is the antenna capacitance. And again, uh, in this case, I calculated it with easy neck uh, and with uh, you know, uh, day counter engineering resources at that address. That's listed in my references, so nobody needs to write it down. But anyway, uh, that was for uh, you know, short whip antennas. And uh, this, you know, again, was for the same thing. And I got the same results. Notice that the diameter goes up, your capacitance goes up but a lot slower than the diameter goes up. So you reach a point where kind of diminishing returns. I said, yeah, 18 millimeters is good on that. That uh, 10 millimeters going to 10 to 18, it's not that much more metal bulk in the air, but above that it builds up rapidly for a little more capacitance. We'll see in a minute why I want a large capacitance. And I also looked at that versus length and notice that changes some with frequency because as the antenna gets longer, you begin to approach, you know, some resonance effects of, of it there. And it's not just a, you know, a piece of metal probing the capacitance of free space. Now, the reason for an interest in, uh, you know, the uh, capacitance of the antenna, we've got the antennas feeding a preamp, uh, which, you know, FET preamp type of uh, things would be typical for this. And antenna will have yeah, a couple ohms resistance there. It'll vary with frequency, but it's negligible compared to the source impedance of the capacitor. So I've got a capacitive divider here, the input capacitance of the FET, which will be the FET itself and straight to ground protection diodes and all kinds of other stuff. So you're typically gonna have about three puffs there on a carefully put together thing, uh, you know, preamp and 10 puff at the antenna. So that's a divider there, so it says, I started with 100 microvolts at my voltage source here, 
well, I loaded it down to 77 microvolts because of that. And then the transconductance, the FET's going to lower some more. And it's in a typical case, it'll lower another, you know, a little at about 10% or so. Uh, now that's a preamp input. Okay, now there's a, a size problem related to the FET that if the FET becomes smaller uh, in area, then the capacitance goes down. Of course, this capacitance from protection diodes and stuff won't go down much, but the capacitance of that goes down, but so does the transconductance. A higher transconductance FET will have better noise figure and be better able to uh, drive whatever load resistor is here. I could almost look at the FET having a perfect FET with a resistor in series right here, which is equal to the reciprocal of the transconductance. So I'm going to have a you know, loss related to driving whatever load is out here. Okay, look at an active ballon uh, there that uh, because I need to be horizontally polarized, the field antenna, it really wants to be vertical as we'll see some uh, from some later stuff. But anyway, uh, the way it's done, and this is done by the LWA and the MWA, they use a preamp for each half of the antenna. And then they use either a transformer or a 180 degree hybrid, which uh, yeah, advantage of 180 degree hybrid is it leaves some isolation between these two amplifier outputs versus a transformer. Uh, transformer is uh, cheap and easy and reasonable. Uh, another uh, you know, example I have of that was a Simwa, which is a symmetrical impedance wandler. That came from a German uh, website where wandler, I think that's how you say it, it's something with a lot of windings or a transformer. So it tr it's basically transforming impedance and it's a you know, symmetrical impedance here and it's transforming it to a low impedance of the coax cable and all that. So that's where Simwa came from. Uh, that paper is listed in my references, uh, again, from, uh, you know, uh, Gunter, uh, yeah, remember, uh, can't remember his last name, but anyway, uh, a very good paper. Uh, uh, LWA, MWA, like I said, use basically the same approach there. Okay, look a little bit at preamp needs. Of course, we had discussed already, uh, yeah, FET, we want that input capacitance as low as possible, very high input impedance. Uh, very low voltage and uh, current noise, good overload and intermodulation characteristics, and may have up to one volt RMS input if you just take these uh, antennas without any additional filtering. Uh, so first, yeah, that's definitely a FET preamp. I mean, yeah, I couldn't find any other you know, component that would do that. And trying to look at uh, wide bandwidth FET op amps to see if they were reasonable for the job. Uh, you know, not reasonable. You really need uh, discrete FETs for that. The discrete FETs are not going to die for a few high impedance applications. Uh, okay, now I talked a little about the need to uh, limit the bandwidth and why. Oops, we're going to go somewhere else first. Uh, in order to build this, I got, uh, I figured I would buy some, uh, you know, FET preamps off of the uh, uh, internet, basically these little voltage probe or mini whip antennas that are sold, they have a fairly small antenna element. They're intended to be, you know, DC to blue light bandwidth, uh, shove it out in your backyard and it'll receive everything. And uh, if it's installed wrong, it receives nothing as we'll see. But anyway, uh, uh, you know, I bought this one off the internet, got a couple of them to play with. And uh, yeah, you know, they ran the FET at uh, way too low of a current, same with the output amplifier. So that's bad for noise and overload effects. Uh, they used, uh, uh, you know, both these used and the original from, uh, you know, Nico, uh, all used a BF998 FET. I suspect BF998s may have been popular. They were used in TV tuners, uh, you know, back before 2000 type of time frame. Yeah, I got a feeling there's probably a million extra BF998 sitting in stock somewhere, uh, you know, available cheap. And that may be why they show up in preamps, but there also are a pretty good fit for this. Uh, uh, so the total design is unknown. Basic layout seems to be uh, taken from uh, PA0NHC, Nico Veth. Uh, and he had a copyrighted design, which is rather interesting. You look at his website, it's one of my references, by the way. Uh, 
so yeah, look it up in the uh, paper. But anyway, he has a big copyright by his design, and it says anyone is allowed to copy his design for personal use. So if I wanted to build, you know, a dozen radio telescope antennas for the backyard, but I'm not selling them, he has no problem with me building a you know dozen of them based on his design. Although he was for a while selling it, he's a retired uh, telecom engineer. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's a little uh, issue of contention. We'll see later. Uh, so anyway, I got this one from, uh, yeah, after seeing the curves were too low, a little, uh, you know, looking at this and, well, maybe this one's better. Okay, current levels are okay. Uh, they had the origin of, you know, it was a, you know, basically from the Ukraine, a copy of, uh, you know, Veth's de design, which he wasn't happy about, because, especially because if you look on the Ukrainian website, You'll see that he tells you, oh, you need support on this thing? Go to this website, you know? So he's not happy having his design stolen for commercial purposes that everybody tried to get support from him, you know? So anyway, uh, Ukrainian design did do a couple of, uh, you know, mods to it that were less than desirable. But the things I ended up buying were a, a Chinese copy of the Ukrainian copy, which uh, turned up with four bad out of the box and actually it ordered five. One of them wasn't in the box, an empty envelope was in the box. This came from Amazon, but uh, you get the same thing occasionally from eBay as well. But four out of four bad. One of them, the connector wasn't soldered uh, properly and they had a solder bridge on it. Uh, the other one, one of the uh, terminals on the little FET down here wasn't soldered down and it, it, it went crazy when you moved your hand around. I finally found that soldered it down. So those two I got working. The other two were exceptionally interesting that uh, BF998 FET was available in two pinouts, uh, apparently put pressed by the TV tuner industry. Well, the other two had the FET of the wrong pinout. I finally figured that out from your readings were totally bizarre on voltmeter readings. So I got two of them sort of working again and that cost me a lot of time on getting things going, to say the least, getting junk out of the box. So uh, I'm not sure if it's five out of five or four out of four bad, because it does an empty envelope count. Anyway, uh, uh, both of these use the BCX54 for an output transistor, which I found a rather interesting thing, uh, because, uh, you know, the Ukrainians, uh, you know, site. It says, we use a BCX54. It's a wonderful transistor for the output transistor for that. And if you were only using it below 10 megahertz, it's not too bad of a choice, but it's bas basically pretty short on bandwidth. Uh, transistor has 100 megahertz F sub T, which F sub T is a frequency where the gain goes to nothing. Uh, the original uh, uh, design from our uh, Dutch friend there uh, I used a uh, 5,000 megahertz F sub T transistor. So he had lots of gain at any frequency you wanted to use it. There was no loss in the transistor. So a good wideband transistor. The other thing uh, Nico did, which was dropped on the others, and I remember I did a presentation on capacitors last year. But anyway, uh, Nico on all the coupling capacitors, he used film type capacitors. Well, film type capacitors basically don't change capacitance any measurable amount from any cause. So it's not, uh, so it's basically a linear thing. Well, the, uh, all of the you know, Chinese or Ukrainian copies used, uh, you know, uh, high K X7, probably X7R, maybe Z5U ceramic capacitors, which are basically the bottom of the barrel for capacitors. I like to joke that the, uh, uh, a Z5U capacitor will change capacitance with the phase of the moon and possibly with the tides in, uh, you know, Mount, Mont, Saint, 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 yeah, Michel. Mich Mount, Saint Michel and uh, France, you know, there were the bizarre tides. I'm sure those tides change and the capacitance value changes on those, which you don't want that on a coupling capacitor. You want it to be very linear. So they used, you know, these copies used capacitors that were less desirable nowhere near the transistor bandwidth they should use. And you know, all of them were broken out of the box, so uh, not a good deal. Had to vent a little steam on that. Now, anyway, I put together a little breadboard thing out of it. This was two of the lower current mini whips, which I had earlier and got working, and uh, put them on a board there and uh, I have a differential transformer there and uh, 
a 10 dB gain uh, mimic after the transformer, then a bias T for the output. And I think I've missed a slide somewhere there. Let me back up. No, okay. So anyway, I put uh, you know, a thing together with that and turned up with some interesting problems related to uh, that as we'll uh, see later. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, notice I put the same one half uh, plus one half not equal to one, you know, you kind of suspect that they have things to add up and sometimes they don't. In this case, it was a monopole is equal one half of a dipole. Well, maybe, sort of, sometimes, something like that. Uh, two monopoles put together not, is not quite equal to a dipole and we're gonna see why in a minute here. Uh, uh, on uh, the German uh, website from uh, uh, Gunther, uh, Fred von Dell, there we go. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, uh, he had a, a good website on how to install these little leaf failed antennas to get the most out of them. They're not the best antenna, but sometimes for HF listening, they're not bad if they're properly installed. But here's what he calls for on an installation. Uh, he says, well, you mount the antenna on a pole you don't let the pole extend past the antenna because it'll begin to short out some of your E-field. So your metal pole goes down there, you run a wire down, you got a ground rod right here, which is uh, assures the antenna is well grounded. Then you run a coax cable in, put a balance over there. There will be no currents on the outside of the coax cable from switching power supplies and LED lights and all the other bad stuff that's floating around inside the house. So that way you stand a chance of it. The, uh, uh, the antenna is only this, but this ground wire right here on the antenna, you know, the grounding path, you know, to the shield of the coax there is part of the effective antenna height. So even though that mini whip is a fairly little thing, the whole antenna height is, you know, all of this, it's cut somewhat effectively by the, uh, you know, way fields cut up as shown in that one slide, but still you get a pretty good effective antenna height. And notice that's vertical polarized. It turns up that even if I turn this antenna on its side, so it seems to be horizontally polarized, it's not because your ground path is the majority of your antenna. So you'll turn up with a little horizontally polarized component in there, but not what I was looking for. Anyway, when I first put the uh, uh, thing together on uh, you know, an antenna there, uh, one of the things I noticed that uh, I was trying to pick up uh, Jupiter early in the morning and there were no storms in the morning uh, that had IO lined up with the zone, so that, which produces a strong storm. So with a single antenna, I was not able to get any Jupiter storms when they were listed as possible, but we didn't have the IO boost. Uh, uh, however, one thing I noticed before I put this rod here, it just had this you know, grounded here to imagine this grounded at this point, no rod that I turned up with, uh, you know, uh, very strong HF uh, signals. I was running into an SDR so I could see the 15 meter hand band. And before the sun was even up, I was seeing 15 meter signals booming in there. And uh, well, a good part of the reason for that is the vertical polarized component of this is good at a low angle. So uh, putting this metal rod in here, which was 1.2 meters, about the same size as that, and carefully centering it, the preamp ground is hooked to there. And then the ground going out of here, uh, put a decoupling uh, uh, choke on it. And that combination, it considerably reduced, I didn't have any actual measurements of it, but it considerably reduced the amount of 15 meter ham signals that were coming in even before the sun was up. But you know, the sun had to be up quite a bit before you got any, and then they were weaker. So it says it was saying pr predominantly horizontally polarized, whereas it had a very strong vertical component until I, uh, carefully balance that out. And that's kind of the thing of, you know, the one plus, one half plus one half, not equal one. You, you have to add this piece in between here. Ah, here's the other one. I was, I think I had this earlier. Anyway, uh, yeah, a lot of these typical E-field antennas, their uh, they're bandwidth is almost DC to blue, blue light. Well, at least it's 10 kilohertz to 50 megahertz or more. Uh, so, you know, that's a lot of unwanted signals you have coming in there. 
And uh, the more unwanted signals there are at once, the more intermodulation problems you're going to have. And when you're trying to get a radio astronomy signal, it's weak. You don't need any, any intermod garbage in there. So, uh, you know, I use the approach to limit the bandwidth. And I said, well, with because of the extremely high input impedance on the FET, uh, it doesn't leave it easy to limit the bandwidth. You have to be quite careful. Uh, however, I found an example from a uh, uh, guy's last name is Binko, uh, call, ham called W0QE. Uh, he did a, a, a very extensive design. He was trying to use it for some survey purpose, RFI things and stuff like that. But one of his requirements was that he should, should be able to get right outside the fence of an AM broadcast station and not have his little vertically polarized uh, search antenna desensitized. So he had an antenna there with a uh, filter with a lot of elements there to get rid of you know, something. So he passes 2.7 to 30 megahertz and by 1.5 megahertz, very little gets through. And at one megahertz, uh, yeah, this thing is stone deaf, you know, it won't hear it. So that allows them to operate close to broadcast stations, one of his requirements. That little coil thing there is 10 point uh, is, uh, uh, FM band. Uh, and that was to allow him to do the same thing near FM stations there. So that was kind of his requirement for his antenna. But I took a look at, you know, I, his design was not what I needed, but I learned a lot for it. Also, the resistors are a slight lossy element. So they're going to add a little bit of noise. So you want to minimize that. So I took his design and considerably simplified it. Like I said, I learned a lot from his design and for what I needed where I, uh, below 15 megahertz, it, uh, yeah, the gain can fall rapidly and worked out. And that inductor, I've got two values on it there because uh, this is, uh, is also a spice input uh, file that I just took and cut them out and used those for pictures because a lot of times easier. But notice I have 4.1 microhenries and the coil I mark is a 4.7. And that's because the uh, parasitics in the coil uh, cause it to be a 4.1 plus a lot of parasitics, which don't show on the screen there. But anyway, uh, that's a 4.7. And this one's a 10 microhenry coil with the uh, resistors there, which are getting out a little bit of noise, but not that much. I run that into the preamp. And uh, yeah, it was interesting. Well, what's the bandwidth of that? Okay, that's a spice simulation, and you can see that it actually peaks up a little bit because of the inductance in there. It causes some resonance peaking with the capacitance, but the resistors damp it so that it's not sharp peaks. Without the resistors, you get a sharp peak here and here, and it fall below the floor right here. Uh, you know, I want it to be fairly flat across that band for radio astronomy. So notice I've actually got a little boost there. And uh, from that filter, if I just went capacitor to capacitor, matched capacitance, I would actually have a 6 dB loss. So that's a fair amount of additional help and signal level due to partially resonating it. And uh, that helps cover up some of the noise of adding a resistor. That filter response is interesting because I took the uh, signal generator, like the one uh, you know, given away as a door prize today, along with the uh, uh, one of the little down converter units to move the 35 megahertz low end of the generator uh, down to here. I think it was a spy verter I used. So that would give me a zero to 60 megahertz source and ran it on an actual built filter on a board. Hey, and guess what? It actually matched the spice simulation. Always wonderful when computer simulations match the world, real world. Uh, seems like sometimes they don't do too well. The next question, does this thing work for radio astronomy? I mean, you know, that's the purpose of it. And well, I went out and I, you know, put it in, uh, you know, Jupiter, well, I had the problem. Jupiter just has not been in a good alignment with IO to work with a single antenna. Uh, I had two antennas, but they were a little different in construction, so I couldn't match them for phase shift enough to use a dual antenna like you normally use for Jove. So, Anyway, I went for a 37.3 megahertz phase shift interferometer. Uh, well, taking a more close look, 37.5 is the start of the radio astronomy band. So that was kind of a poor choice of frequency. Uh, but anyway, you see the antenna because of the uh, you know breadboard style circuitry out there. Got a raincoat and a couple of people suggested maybe I need to put a hat on it there and a couple of gloves and make a scarecrow out of it. I don't know. But anyway, that might allow you to hide them from the homeowners association if it looks like a scare scarecrow. 
Uh, anyway, so here's what the receiver looked like for that. Uh, I've got uh, cables coming from two antennas, which are a little different in construction, which is why they wouldn't make a good, uh, you know, Jupiter pair. But anyway, I bias he to power the preamps. Antennas come up. Then I went to, this is a phase switch, which switches the phase back and forth between zero and 180 degrees, uh, uh, 610 times a second. Uh, use a little balance mixer module. And the other path went straight through. And this, this is a summer down here. It's a TV splitter used in reverse, and they do work very well. And I used exactly the same arrangement uh, probably about five years ago at uh, Green Bank with a couple of 408 megahertz Yaggies and just put the little scanner at 408 and ran it into software lock-in amplifier. And I was able to sense the sun, SIG A and CAS A. And I thought, well, I should be able to get that at 38 megahertz with the dipoles, adding up the signal strengths. It looks like it should barely get there. Uh, well, that didn't quite work as expected, let's say. Uh, so anyway, so software was running a lock-in amp, and then I ran it into a spreadsheet later to you know, graph things out. Now, one of the things I do when I have a spreadsheet of an interferometer thing, I do a little banging on a couple of lines of text and put, uh, that is the fringe rate that I would get, in that case, for Cygnus A. And that one, uh, the green is for Cas A. And then I use this, I just put a line across there with the discontinuity where uh, to mark the transit. This is Cas A transits here, uh, or Sig A Cas, uh, here, Cas A here. So I was expecting to see interferometer fringes where they would kind of run into each other here and make a mess and not this kind of crazy mess here. But my gosh, what the heck is that? You know, uh, you know, a lot of noise, no interferometer. Yeah, and I tried to, you know, in the day during the sun, I said, well, the sun's quite a bit stronger. It ought to be able to produce still no fringes. I said, well, this is obviously a fringe case here. So I've got a little more bad data, but this was uh, more carefully, uh, you know, looked at. And you can see how this thing is wildly bouncing around. And I took a look at, well, uh, I took the timestamps in my output file rather than just the uh, counts I used along here. And I took a look at the timestamps. What's going on in the house? Well, uh, 3.26 p.m., 7.48 p.m. I was taking an afternoon snooze that day and my uh, wife was sitting there reading. So we didn't have anything running in the house. It was nice and quiet across there. Uh, all right, uh, 8 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., uh, we were doing our little exercise video to try to, you know, keep my stomach from getting too flabby. And again, nothing is turned on in the house. Uh, the computer was turned on both in this and this case, but it's at the other end of the house from uh, problem. I can see, well, that's fairly smooth curve there. And then uh, let's see, uh, you can see it's all noisy. There. It's doing a lot of things around the house, the lights going on and off. And then 9.30 p.m. to uh, 9.53 p.m., we were driving out to get fast food. Notice that was closer to that line. I left one light on in my workshop accidentally. I said, eh, that's interesting, you know, that's a uh, LED light, you know, and that's a little different. And then the uh, house was fairly quiet then. I was expecting to see some fringes there and there was still a little too much noise to get the fringe. But uh, that's when I got up in the morning. I thought I times wake up at three in the morning, can't sleep, a little insomnia. So anyway, I wake up, turn on a few lights in the coffee pot because I'm not going to sleep anyway. And all of a sudden the noise level is off the chart. It's running. So this seemed to be a fairly normal noise level. And you can see it's just all over the place. And because it's an interferometer, it can get both negative and positive outputs. And if everything's perfect, you just see a, you know, a little less, you know, sine wave-like thing uh, crawling across the, you know, there. So Anyway, that uh, kind of told me what the problem was. And I probably should have had a better clue at that because I spent part of my career, uh, you know, doing uh, testing of things for FCC emissions and also a little bit of uh, uh, stuff for mill standard emissions, uh, which are much tighter than FCC. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's kind of interesting, uh, uh, FCC 15, which you know, basically regulates home entertainment, uh, uh, part of CFR or something or whatever, but everybody just calls it 15. But 30 to 60 megahertz is uh, a little bit of an RFI no man's land. 
because zero uh, from you know 100 kilohertz, I think it is, to 30 megahertz, you test conducted emissions. You see what's coming out the the wires coming out of something uh, from 30 megahertz to 1,000 megahertz, and now I think it's 1,500 or something higher. Uh, because of more computing devices. But anyway, there you check for radiated emissions. Well, between 30 and 60 megahertz, uh, a lot of things are way too small to radiate anything. And you're not checking the conducted emissions anymore. So something has a lot of crap in that frequency range. Uh, but, it's, you know, but it's a device that's physically small, like a you know, light bulb. Well, it's kind of in a no man's land. Now, I think it's uh, all the LED lighting that we have around the house was probably a lot of the uh, you know, source of that kind of thing. So basically I learned that and this is gonna be true of any kind of uh, you know, uh, you know, dipole antenna. If you get the VLF, what, what it was, I can't think of the name of the antenna now. Anyway, the, uh, uh, the uh, small dipoles, which you can uh, actually buy from, uh, you know, with as a kid if you uh, want to get some. But anyway, uh, they will have that same exact problem. Any, uh, you know, active antenna or small dipole will have that lack of, uh, you know, directivity. It'll get stuff off the side and you'll get a lot of garbage, you know, coming in there. So it's not unique to the particular designs that I had here. Uh, the interferometer just showed it up in a little different of a way there. And you look at it, almost wonder if there was a slight sign of fringes there, but yeah, 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 kind of have to really imagine it, you know, and these little lines are to help you imagine fringes, but uh, you did a pretty good imagination to see fringes that match either of those patterns there. So anyway, it was basically the RFI uh, situation, which has told me that, you know, the, those antennas are going to be of limited usefulness unless you can put them in the middle of nowhere. Uh, like I said, the uh, uh, two uh, you know, things there were up front, the, uh, 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 what is it? Yeah, can't think of it. Anyway, the uh, uh, arrays of those things, I mean, you know, they're out in the middle of the, de uh, the desert and you have 500 to 1,000 of those. So basically you build up a good directivity from a lot of antennas summed together. And then they're in the middle of the desert so they don't have an uh, LED light bulb 100 feet away from it. Hey, so uh, two minutes. Uh, okay, so anyway, that's uh, about the situation with what I ran with uh, for that. So I don't think they're going to be as useful as I uh, had hoped they would be. So that's it. Oh, by the way, my uh, because of uh, this and a uh, good picture I had, got a new name for my observatory. It's a VRO. That's a Vulture's Roost Observatory. I think they're attracted to projects that didn't quite work right or something like that. Uh, another day I had eight vultures up there on my ham antennas looking down at the radio telescope stuff. But uh, anyway, so it, it, uh, the vultures roost observatory. So I do have an official name, not, not as nice as like Cox Nest or Helio Town. But anyway, that's it. And All right. Quite, excellent. Quite, Okay, questions I think are going to have to be zoomed here. Well, let's uh, let's get Sander. Sander uh, had two que a couple questions there. So, Sander, why don't you come on and ask uh, Bruce your questions or comments? Well, okay, I don't. I'm waiting. Sander, can you hear us? Go off mute. Okay. Bruce, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I hear you. All right. Uh, let me jump to my second comment, which I, I think is more important. It's, I don't see why you want a high impedance, low noise amplifier. You could get system noise dominated by the sky noise, which is, as you showed, is very high, using bipolar transistor amplifiers with 50 ohm input impedance such as the mini circuits galley series of amplifiers. And there's a article by Brian Hicks that I included the reference uh, uh, in, in the chat, uh, which describes the, both the dipoles and the, uh, the amplifier used on the LWA, both in New Mexico and at the Caltech Radio Observatory, uh, used in the 20 to 80 megahertz band. And when I say sky noise limited, dominated, what I mean 
is that uh, the amplifier noise is probably above, it's above 290 Kelvin, it, it may be uh, 1000 Kelvin or so. But the sky noise is so high, that, as you, you realize, uh, that uh, uh, it, it's fine. Uh, uh, so that, that's my comment. Uh, okay, uh, as a matter of fact, the Hicks paper is one of my references on that. Uh, and uh, looking at the uh, you know, galley uh, ICs there, notice that the Hicks, the dipoles were fairly large. So they were essentially a broadband dipole and a lot bigger than that. Yeah. And as the antenna gets smaller, the benefit of going to high impedance becomes significant. Uh, for a larger antenna, the uh, up near closer to 40 megahertz, uh, you know, using a, uh, a different preamp arrangement would probably be profitable. But uh, uh, you know, down at the 20 megahertz end, with that small of an antenna, uh, the high impedance uh, preamps do give a lot better uh, performance. Okay, from, uh, ex analysis. excellent answer. I, I haven't looked at the problem from that standpoint of, of a very short uh, dipole. The, the, uh, the, the LWA dipoles are a couple of meters long. You're, you're talking about something shorter. So you might be right. I, I think your, your answer is right on. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. Excellent. Uh, Bruce, as usual, excellent work. And uh, um, we're going to go on to our next speaker.